of it later in our program schedule. The House has just come back in. It's coming up soon, they'll be taking up the 2012 Defense Programs Bill. Live coverage of the House now on C-SPAN. It's a 10 successive terms in Congress. He retired in 1975. Of course, all of my colleagues know that Peter's son, Rodney, our distinguished colleague here in the House, is now in mourning, as is the rest of the family. So on this sad day, I would invite all of my colleagues to join me in extending extending to Rodney and his brothers Frederick and Peter and his sisters Beatrice and Adeline and their families our deepest and most profound condolences. Peter Hood Ballantyne Freelinghiser was proud of his work in the House. He was loved by the people of New Jersey and we thank him for his extraordinary legacy of service. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? Without objection, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, health care is a right, not a privilege. We made a promise to our seniors that they will have health care when they retire, that they will not have to wither away as they age. But Republicans have broken that promise. Republicans, by passing the Ryan budget, believe that seniors should fend for themselves, that America should not honor the bargain made with its seniors. It's simple, Mr. Speaker. Republicans don't like Medicare. I'm glad this new majority is showing its true colors, and it's no surprise that Americans don't like this position. They didn't like it when they tried to privatize Social Security, and they don't like the Republican plan to voucherize Medicare. Republicans would rather break this promise for their partisan ideological crusade. In contrast, Democrats stand with America's seniors. We believe America should keep its promise to America's seniors. We believe America's seniors deserve better. Support Medicare. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. To what purpose does a gentleman from New Hampshire rise? Address the House for one minute and rise and accept my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, yesterday America lost a great public servant, a great friend of the state of New Jersey, the father of one of my, if not my best friend in Congress, a friend of my family's, and just a wonderful guy. Mr. Freelingheisen, as I knew him, Peter Freelingheisen, served in the Congress, as my friend from New Jersey just mentioned, from 1953 to 1975. He was the second or third oldest former member of Congress. Now my father, who's 98, is the oldest former member of Congress. And our families grew up together. We grew up in the spirit of public service, of good friendship, of bipartisanship, and of action. I remember Mr. Freelingheisen so well as a child bringing us around here in the chamber and around Capitol Hill and even out to amusement parks in the Washington, D.C. area. He was a great father to his five children. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, he was a great American and a, and a very fine, distinguished member of Congress. I will miss him. I know his family will miss him. I know the citizens of New Jersey will miss him. He was a great American, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, these are tough times for the American people everywhere. In my home state of California, families face a 12 percent unemployment rate, and the gas prices are well over $4 a gallon. But instead of working together to solve the problems, Republican leadership has voted in Medicare as we know it. And it extends the tax breaks to companies that ship jobs overseas. This week, the Senate will have its chance to vote on a reckless Republican budget. The consequences of this misguided plan are devastating for the senior citizens. And I state, devastating to the senior citizens and the middle class. In California alone, the Republican budget would cost seniors, I state, cost seniors over $214 billion in higher prescription drug costs next year. Cut almost $54 billion in Medicare funding for seniors and disabled. And the cost to us is 186000 that would go to the private sector jobs that will be lost over the next five years. We must stop this crap plan. Let us work together on a reasonable budget to protect Medicare 
I yield back and balance my time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? I rise to address the House for one minute and ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to talk about jobs. Over a month ago, I launched my participation in American Job Creators. All too often in Washington, regulations are created that end up stifling job creation across our nation. That is why I chose to participate in American Job Creators. With unemployment at 9 percent, it was common sense to me to ask the job creating experts what regulations are affecting their ability to grow and expand. One job creator in my district, Jody, is a home builder. She went to AmericanJobCreators.com and used the platform to communicate with me. Jody identified the onerous banking regulations created by the Dodd-Frank Act, making it more difficult for contractors to borrow money from lending institutions. This in turn makes it more difficult to complete and start new projects. We know that ho the housing crisis has made it difficult on the construction industry, but adding these regulations has further stifled the industry's ability to recover and to create jobs in America. I would like to thank Jody for her participation and encourage more people to go to AmericanJobCreators.com. With that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Maryland rise? Without objection, the gentlewoman from Maryland is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to join with the American people to protect Medicare. It's pretty simple. The Republicans, if they had their way, it would mean a catastrophic end to the program and it would deep six protections for seniors and improvements to Medicare that we made under the Affordable Care Act. Medicare has long been a reliable source of coverage for seniors, ensuring they can afford the care they need. In Maryland, the GOP plan would force seniors to pay nearly $6,800 more in out-of-pocket expenses for health care in the first year alone. And at a time when seniors are economically vulnerable, this proposal would further threaten their quality of life. And while their budget to date hasn't produced a single jobs creating bill, what they would do in these next uh, several months is to cut more than two million private sector jobs across the country. And so right now the Republicans are heading for the hills trying to distance themselves from what they're trying to do to Medicare. But it's clear that the American people want to protect Medicare. And so I urge my colleagues to join with us and oppose this controversial change that would end the decades old promise to the American people. It's a simple question. Whose side are you on? Well, I'm on the side and Democrats on the side of seniors and not the wealthy health insurance industry and big oil bandits. And with that, I yield. General Woman's time has expired. For what purpose does the General Woman from Michigan rise? Without objection, the General Woman's recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, we just heard from a leader of the nation that is one of America's greatest friends and allies, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of the Nation of Israel. And the Prime Minister was correct in saying that in the often shifting alliances in the Middle East, only Israel stands as our unwavering ally. And his message for peace and security should not be heard just in this chamber, but across the world. Many in the world often like to scapegoat Israel as the cause of instability in the Middle East and the reason why a Palestinian state has not been created and nothing can be further from the truth. As the Prime Minister said, the conflict has never been about the establishment of a Palestinian state. It has always been about the existence of a Jewish state. And it is time for the Palestinian President Abbas to stand before his people and state that he is ready to accept peace and live side by side with the Jewish state of Israel. Only then can peace be achieved. Until that time and on until the future, the people of the world should know that the United States of America will always stand strong with the nation of Israel. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back.
Yeah. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further proceedings today on the motion to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered or on which the vote incurs objection under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Any record, recorded vote on the postponed question will be taken later. For what purpose does a gentleman from Missouri seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass the bill S-990 with an amendment to provide for an additional temporary extension of programs under the Small Business Act and the Small Business Investment Act of 1958 and for other purposes. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 990, an act to provide for an additional temporary extension of programs under the Small Business Act and the Small Business Investment Act of 1958 and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Graves, and the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members shall have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, America's 27 million small businesses drive the U.S. economy, uh, drive its growth and innovation. Those small companies have created 64 percent of our net new jobs over the past 15 years. Strong, vibrant economies are built from the ground up, and as our nation's entrepreneurs are making decisions to take risks and invest, they need to know that their elected officials are looking out for them and providing them with the certainty they need to have confidence moving forward. That confidence will result in increased economic output, new jobs, and a better way of life for all Americans. The legislation we have before us is a simple extension of programs overseen by the Small Business Administration through September 30, 2011. The current authorizing legislation expires at the end of this month, and we need additional time to continue our legislative work. Chief among the programs we are extending today is the Small Business Innovative Research Act, the largest federal government small business research and development initiative. Earlier this month, the Small Business Committee held a markup, or markup of legislation that would fully authorize the SBIR program through 2014. This bipartisan legislation passed our committee by voice vote and we are ready to bring this legislation to the floor to provide our small entrepreneurs with the certainty that they need to move forward. Unfortunately, the long-term SBI reauthorization introduced by our counterparts in the other body has been stalled and the prospect of them passing that legislation still remains unclear. We have reached out to the other body and are continuing a constructive dialogue on finding a solution to fully authorize the SBIR program as well as other important small business initiatives. It is my hope that we can continue to work in a bipartisan and bicameral way to pass this long-term reauthorization. I would urge my colleagues to vote yes on S990 as amended and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentlewoman from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, the economy is showing signs of recovery on several fronts, adding one million jobs in the last six months. While this is very good news, we still have a long way to go, and this is why we need small firms more than ever. Small businesses which create two-thirds of new jobs drive employment gains and economic expansion. Time and time again, they have generated the ideas and now and know-how that spark job growth. However, entrepreneurs must have the resources and tools they need to start up or expand. The legislation we are considering today provides them and extends their authorization of several small business administration programs. For many firms, these initiatives are critical, enabling them to secure financing and more effectively compete for federal contracts. While we must keep these programs operational, it is unfortunate that we are doing so through another temporary extension. However, it is my hope that we can reach a lasting agreement on the agency's authorization so that we do not have to come back here again in a few months. Small businesses across the nation depend on a strong SBA. This is especially true now when many unemployed individuals are turning to entrepreneurship as a source of income. By ensuring that the agency's programs do not last, 
We are providing small businesses with a foundation for future growth and in doing so, helping move the economy forward. I urge a yes vote and reserve the balance of my time. Gentlewoman from New York, reserve. I, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back the balance of her time. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in closing, let me reiterate that small businesses can and will lead our economic recovery. <laughs> this is a very strong case for fully authorizing the SBIR and STTR uh, programs. They have a proven track record of creating jobs, advancing uh, innovative science in the marketplace, and solving federal agency problems. These programs provide a bridge between product conception and marketability and a step of vital importance for innovative ideas to become a reality. The new technologies and discoveries that come out of these programs go a long way towards keeping our competitive edge in the world marketplace. And the SBIR and STTR programs are the kind of public-private partnership that is essential to the continued growth of our economy. I look forward to working with Ranking Member Velasquez, our colleagues on the Small Business Committee, and our colleagues in the other body on a long-term reauthorization in the coming months. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Both sides having yield back their time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass Senate 990 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from North Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the House Republican Conference, I send to the desk a privileged resolution and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Resolution 274, resolved that the following named member be and is hereby elected to the following standing committee of the House of Representatives. One, Committee on Education and the Workforce, Mr. Goodlatte to rank immediately after Ms. Fox. Without objection, the resolution is agreed to and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What purpose does a gentlewoman from North Carolina seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the proceedings during the recess be printed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Look at that word right there. I know they always use that hand. They do? 
Yeah, they always say that had during recess. The woman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 269 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 39, House Resolution 269. Resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the Bill H.R. 1216 to amend the Public Health Service Act to convert funding for graduate medical education and qualified teaching health centers from direct appropriations to an authorization of appropriations. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Education and Commerce. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. The bill shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill are waived. No amendment to the bill shall be in order except those received for printing in the portion of the congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18 in a daily issue dated May 23, 2011, and accept pro forma amendments for the purpose of debate. Each amendment so received may be offered only by the member who caused it to be printed or a designee and shall be considered as read if printed. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2. At any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the Bill H.R. 1540 to authorize appropriations for the fiscal year 2012 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction to prescribe military personnel strengths for fiscal year 2012 and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Armed Services. After general debate, the Committee of the Whole shall rise without motion. No further consideration of the bill shall be in order except pursuant to a subsequent order of the House. Section 3. The requirement of Clause 6A, Rule 13, for a two-thirds vote to consider a report from the Committee on Rules on the same day it is presented to the House is waived re with respect to any resolution reported through the legislative day of May 27, 2011, providing for consideration or disposition of a measure addressing expiring provisions of the USA Patriot Improvement and Reauthorization Act of 2005. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. Without objection, and the woman is, uh, gentlewoman is recognized. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. House Resolution 269 provides for a modified open rule providing for consideration of H.R. 1216, which amends the Public Health Service Act to convert funding for graduate medical education and qualified teaching health centers from mandatory spending to an authorization of appropriations. H.R. 1540, the National Defense Authorization Act, and same-day consideration of a rule to consider extending certain provisions of the USA Patriot Act. Mr. Speaker, this is the seventh modified open rule that the House Republican majority has offered this Congress, compared to the Liberal Democrats' one modified open rule during the entire 111th Congress. The first underlying bill today, H.R. 1216, continues the fulfillment of the Republican Pledge to America and illustrates that once again Republicans are keeping our promises to the American people to cut federal spending. The American people want transparency of Washington's spending of hard-earned taxpayer dollars. 
In an act of gross irresponsibility, the federal government is spending one out of four dollars of gross domestic product. We hear the term federal money, Mr. Speaker, as though it is manna from heaven. Let me dispel that misconception, Mr. Speaker. The federal government has only the money it takes away from hardworking American families through taxes or the money it borrows. As a nation, we are currently borrowing 43 cents for every dollar spent at the federal level. Some argue that to balance the federal government and pay down our debt, we should raise taxes. As a fiscal conservative, I do disagree. Raising taxes on hardworking Americans and job creators is simply a way to pass the blame. We must rein in out of control Washington spending and put an end to it. The American people are sick and tired of reckless government spending and Washington's disregard for basic budgeting principles of living within its means. This is one of the many reasons I urge my colleagues to support this rule and the underlying bill before us today, Mr. Speaker. H.R. 1216 restores congressional oversight to federal spending by ending the autopilot spending for physician residency programs at teaching health centers and restoring it to the annual appropriations process. When a program is put on autopilot, Congress abdicates its authority to unelected bureaucrats and takes a hands-off approach. House Republicans are committed to ending that approach to federal spending and ensuring that government programs are accountable for how they are spending money. No longer will we accept politically popular excuses. Each program must prove that it is a wise steward of taxpayer dollars. If Congress will not address out-of-control spending now, we're passing the buck to our children and grandchildren. Therefore, I commend my Republican colleagues at the House Energy and Commerce Committee for seeking to end mandatory or autopilot funding for the programs in the Liberal Democrats' government takeover of health care. Because the liberal elites knew their government takeover of health care was unpopular and would likely have consequences at the ballot box, they included $105 billion in mandatory taxpayer spending in the law itself to protect their favorite programs. Let me take a moment, Mr. Speaker, to explain the difference between discretionary and mandatory government spending. Discretionary spending is appropriated by Congress annually and therefore subject to congressional oversight and review. Discretionary spending allows members of Congress the opportunity to be wise stewards of the taxpayers' money by not funding ineffective or duplicative programs. On the contrary, mandatory spending operates irrespective of congressional appropriations and must be spent whether we have the money or not. The most recognized mandatory spending programs are Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which operate on autopilot and have not been subject to congressional oversight from year to year as funds automatically stream from the Treasury to anyone who qualifies for a particular benefit. It cannot be emphasized enough that the liberal elites in Washington chose to hastily to ram through their government takeover of health care with no regard for the staunch opposition of the American people. The audacity of an elected official, or worse, an unelected bureaucrat, basically saying to a taxpayer that he or she knows how to spend the taxpayer's money better than the individual taxpayer is appalling. That is why the ruling liberal elites in Washington did when they that is what the ruling liberal elites in Washington did when they chose to forego the annual appropriations, also known as oversight process, by putting their favorite programs on autopilot under Obamacare. Mr. Speaker, it's my firm belief that Washington should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. During committee consideration of the underlying bill, my Republican colleagues pointed out that the Liberal Democrats in control last Congress put the funding for residencies at teaching, center, teaching health centers on autopilot but left residency programs at children's hospitals to fend for themselves in the annual appropriations process. In fact, President Obama's FY 2012 budget pro proposes eliminating funding for residency programs at Children's Hospital. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's hard to understand why residencies at teaching health centers should receive special treatment 
Why were these residency programs protected while others languished and eventually were proposed to be eliminated? This is a classic example of Washington bureaucrats deciding which programs will win and which will lose. As I said earlier, every program should be properly scrutinized by Congress through the appropriations process and be accountable for how it is spending taxpayer money. While this accountability should always be important, it's even more critical because we're facing the third straight year of trillion dollar deficits. This fiscal year, our deficit will be $1.6 trillion. Mr. Speaker, remember the figure I mentioned earlier about our nation's borrowing habits? We're borrowing 43 cents of every dollar the federal government spends. This translates to a national debt that has now reached more than $14 trillion and has gotten the attention of the American people. If you're having a hard time visualizing $14 trillion, let me put it this way. If America was required to pay back its national debt right now, each citizen, man, woman, and child, would owe more than $46,000. The simple truth is that we have a spending crisis in this town due in large part to mandatory spending that operates on autopilot. House Republicans are committed to bringing government spending under control, and we're continuing to build on our pledge to America by restoring congressional oversight and accountability for government programs. Again, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote for this rule and the underlying bills, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from North Carolina reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the gentlelady from North Carolina, my friend Dr. Fox, for yielding me the customary 30 minutes, and I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. Without objection, and the gentleman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this rule allows for the consideration of H.R. 1216, the Graduate Medical Education Direct Spending Repeal Act, and general debate for H.R. 1540, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012. And this rule also allows for a martial law consideration of the reauthorization of the Patriot, Patriot Act sometime this week. Frankly, uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a disappointing rule. While I have no problem with the rule providing for general debate for the Defense Authorization Bill, it is disappointing that this rule also includes these two other provisions, especially the martial law rule. Let me begin with H.R. 1216. This bill is simple. It's another chance for the Republicans to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. It's one more part of their repeal agenda. The funny thing uh, is, Mr. Speaker, Republicans continue to push their repeal agenda, but they haven't put any plan forward to replace these new health care protections that we passed. The truth is that the Republicans are not only trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, they're also trying to repeal Medicare. This is outrageous. The American people do not want the House Republicans to dismantle Medicare. The Affordable Care Act, Mr. Speaker, provides dedicated funding for the training of family doctors through graduate medical education programs at teaching health centers. The Republicans, uh, while they claim they support doctors and training programs, don't believe in this dedicated funding. This bill not only rescinds the direct funding for these programs, it reduces the authorization by nearly $50 million. Now, everyone knows that there's a shortage of primary care physicians in this country. Why, then, do Republicans want to undercut efforts to bring physicians into areas of desperate need? Making these funds discretionary will jeopardize the 11 programs currently underway across the country, including one program in my home state of Massachusetts. Making these funds discretionary does nothing to help our constituents who are struggling to obtain primary care. Making this program discretionary will deter other entities from making business decisions necessary to expand residency training. Decisions like securing commitments from key stakeholders to agree to train new or additional residents, applying for accreditation if not already eligible, and hiring new faculty if funding, over the, uh, if funding, uh, if hiring new faculty with funding over the next few years. Finally, uh, claims that this bill saves hundreds of millions of dollars are just not true. Republicans may claim that this bill will cut nearly $200 million from the deficit, but that's only true if Congress provides no funding for this program. CBO, the nonpartisan budget arbiter that Republicans frequently ignore, 
estimates that $184 million will be appropriated over five years, meaning only $11 million will be saved by H.R. 1216. So claims of this incredible fiscal austerity are simply not true. Now, a second part of this rule is the martial law portion for same-day consideration of the Patriot Act extension. The Senate is currently debating this reauthorization, and the Republicans feel it necessary to once again jam this bill through uh, this House uh, as, soon as, the Senate is done, as soon as the Senate is done with it. This is no way to debate legislation dealing with our homeland security and basic civil rights and civil liberties. This is an important issue. Members need time to be able to understand all the implications of the Patriot Act. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, let me say just a few words about the FY 2012 National Defense Authorizations Act, which will begin general debate later today. All members of this House are strongly committed to protecting our national security, regardless of party, region, or political point of view. It has be, been the tradition of the House Armed Services Committee at the staff and member level to work in a bipartisan way to carefully craft the annual defense authorizations bill, and I recognize Chairman Buck McKeon and Ranking Member Adam Smith for continuing that collegiality. But given such a tradition, it comes as a surprise to see so many provisions in H.R. 1540 that attempt to repudiate and attack several of the President's national security policies, from warehousing low-level detainees for an indeterminate amount of time, to delaying the implementation of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, to hamstringing the implementation of the bipartisan-supported New START Treaty, to seeking a so-called updated authorization for the use of military force that no longer references the devastating 9-11 attacks against America, but instead gives broad authority to the executive branch to pursue military operations anywhere for any length of time. Such changes have all the appearance of a partisan agenda. This afternoon, the Rules Committee will be reviewing many of the amendments on these and other issues, and I hope that they will be made in order so that a broad range of issues and recommendations might be considered and voted upon by this body. Now, a number of those amendments will deal with the future of our policy and military operations in Afghanistan. As most of my colleagues know, I believe that we need to rethink our strategy in Afghanistan. It is bankrupt, bankrupting our nation. The gentlelady from North Carolina talks about the deficit. I will remind her and others that we are borrowing to pay for the war in Afghanistan. We are borrowing approximately $8.2 billion a month. That's billion with a B. So if we're going to get serious about deficit reduction, we either need to end these wars, which I think we should do, or if you support them, you ought to pay for them. Uh, this war has already demanded the lives of 1,573 of our servicemen and women and gravely wounded tens of thousands of our troops. And right now, there is no true end in sight. The death of Osama bin Laden creates an opportunity for us to reexamine our policy in Afghanistan and ask the President exactly how and when he will bring the last troops home to their families and their communities. The death of bin Laden provides us with a moment to commend our intelligence and uniformed men and women, and it also allows us to bring fresh eyes to what kind of defense budget and priorities best fit the needs of our nation and our national security, especially in these difficult economic times. I hope that the Rules Committee will embrace such a debate, allow a broad range of amendments to be made in order, and support a fresh and critical examination of the policies and priorities put forward in H.R. 1540. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I thank my colleague from um, Massachusetts for bringing up some issues that need to be responded to. Um, first of all, let me say, he, he says that we plan to repeal Medicare. It was the Democrats who, in voting for... Uh, the Health Care Act that took over health care in this country to the federal government who cut $500 billion from Medicare, a half a trillion dollars. Republicans have made no recommendations to cut Medicare at all. Only the Democrats have voted to do that, not Republicans. Republicans want to save Medicare, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are doing. We're recommending that we save Medicare for the future. They, the Democrats are the only ones who want to repeal Medicare by cutting that money from it. Let me mention a couple of other things that 
my colleague has uh, spoken about in terms of underlying bills. In terms of the Patriot Act, I believe it is the Attorney General, the Democrat Attorney General, Mr. Holder, who has recommended not only that the Patriot Act be renewed, but that all three of these provisions be made permanent. It is coming from that side of the aisle that the, they want the Patriot Act renewed. So their president is pushing for this. In terms of borrowing for the war, Mr. Speaker, you know, it is the federal government and only the federal government that provides for the national defense of this country. That is why we have a federal government, Mr. Speaker. It's why we became the United States. No other branch of government can provide for our national security. Every other branch of government, however, can handle health care, can handle education, can handle many of the things that the federal government has gotten itself into that it has no business being involved in. So if we had to borrow money, we wouldn't be borrowing money if we weren't in these other things. We'd have ample resources to provide for the national defense. But I'd also like to point out to my colleague from Massachusetts that it was a Democratic president who took us into a third war with no authorization from the Congress. And it is not the Republicans who are creating this problem. Mr. Speaker, the second bill made in order under this rule is H.R. 1540, the National Defense Authorization Act. Mr. Speaker, this weekend we'll all pause to observe Memorial Day, as we should. As we debate this very important bill, we need to keep in mind the men and women of the armed forces and their families. We also need to keep in mind those who've made the ultimate sacrifice in defense of all of our freedoms, including this process of freely debating our laws and the idea of the role of government. We could not be here today without the sacrifices of those who served in the military and kept us a free people. And I hope that's what everyone keeps on their mind this weekend when they celebrate Memorial Day. As James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, quote, the operations of the federal government will be most extensive import and important in times of war and danger, end quote. Our founding fathers had a clear view that the primary and central job of the federal government was to, quote, provide for the common defense, end quote. Providing for the common defense is the mandate of our Constitution. It's not an issue that should divide us in partisan rancor, but unite us as a country that supports our military and provides them with the tools to do their very important job. One need not look too far back in history to find words that remind us of our responsibility to provide for the common defense. President Ronald Reagan in his first inaugural address promised to, quote, check and reverse the growth of government but also to maintain sufficient strength to prevail if need be, knowing that if we do so, we will have the best chance of never having to use that strength." End quote. That message, Mr. Speaker, still holds true today. Not only does this bill ensure that our troops are properly equipped, but it also provides the men and women of the military and their families with the resources and support they need, deserve, and have earned. The fiscal year 2012 National Defense Authorization Act takes a detailed approach to ensuring that the investments in our national security are in line with our fiscal priorities and realities. The bill has a clear mandate of fiscal responsibility, transparency, and accountability within the Department of Defense. It also provides incentives to have competition for every taxpayer dollar associated with funding of defense requirements. The bill addresses a wide range of recent policy changes at the Department of Defense, including the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, reaffirming the Defense of Marriage Act, which protects one man, one woman marriage, as well as ensuring that our military is properly equipped, trained, and staffed for any future threats to our national security. Just as our men and women in uniform stand ready to defend our country, Congress must also tackle the fiscal crisis facing our nation. 
Nothing, Mr. Speaker, is more dangerous to our national security than the crushing de debt that our country is in. Many of my colleagues have come to the floor warning that the sky was going to fall and Armageddon would be upon us if we did not raise the debt ceiling. Well, last week we hit the debt ceiling, and guess what? The sky's still up there, and we're paying our bills. History shows that in 1985, 1995, and 2002, Congress delayed raising the debt ceiling for months without an Armageddon-like economic meltdown. Our intent on this side of the aisle is to pay down the debt with fiscally disciplined and responsible budgets that reduce deficit spending. With a system like that in place, there'll be no need to continue to raise the debt ceiling and creating further financial burdens that can cost each American over $40,000. Imagine a better American f future. Imagine what Americans can achieve if we're freed from Washington's debt burden. On March 16, 2006, a young senator took the floor in the United States Senate and said, quote, the fact that we're here today to debate raising America's debt limit is a sign of leadership failure. It is a sign that the U.S. government can't pay its own bills. It's a sign we now depend on ongoing financial assistance from foreign countries to finance our government's reckless fiscal policy. Mr. Speaker, that senator voted against raising the debt ceiling, and that senator was Barack Obama, our current president. And as far as that statement goes, I agree with the President that our dependency on foreign funds is reckless and an endanger to our national security. Just as dangerous is the failure to achieve energy security. Republicans strongly believe that energy security depends on domestic energy production. Our friends, the Liberal Democrats and President Obama, have actively blocked and delayed American energy production destroying jobs, raising energy prices, and making the U.S. more reliant on unstable foreign countries for energy. This is hurting American families and small businesses who are vital to creating the new private sector jobs we so desperately need during this time of high unemployment. The liberal proposals fail to create jobs in America, but help create jobs overseas for the citizens of foreign nations. We need policies that allow us to take advantage of our natural resources and our innovative culture to develop new sources of energy and create jobs here at home. To date, the Obama administration has pursued an anti-energy agenda, rife with policies that block domestic energy production and destroy jobs. The consequences of this agenda are dire. In the short term, it fuels a rise in gas prices and costs for consumers, and in the long term, it limits innovation and stifles economic growth and job creation. Mr. Speaker, we need to approve this rule which we are debating and the underlying bills so that we can stop the funding of abortions and so that we can fund our military, and we need to look at the other policies that are being promoted by our colleagues on the other side of the aisle and in the White House to see that we be can become more secure as a nation. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from North Carolina reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts Speaker, is recognized. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I feel I need to clarify the record on a couple of things. My friend from North Carolina said that the Republicans uh, want to protect Medicare. I would suggest that she read the bill that she voted for and other Republicans voted for, the so-called Ryan budget. And the way they pr sit, protect Medicare is by destroying it. They turn it into a voucher system. And it will mean seniors will pay more and they will get less protection. It is outrageous what they're proposing. And more and more Americans are reading the bill and they are outraged by what they are seeing. Democrats, and I hope some thoughtful Republicans, will stand firm and protect Medicare. It is the most important, successful program in our history, along with Social Security. And efforts to dismantle it, you know, and to put more burden on our senior citizens and more uh, for, for their health care, and to basically the, a, a major giveaway to the insurance companies, uh, is not protecting Medicare. 
and the general aide talks about the reckless spending in Washington. Uh, I will remind all of my colleagues that when Bill Clinton left office, we didn't have a deficit. We were paying down our debt. And there was a detailed article in the Washington Post not too long ago explaining how we went from no deficit to now a huge deficit. And it includes tax giveaways to the wealthiest people in this country that were not paid for. You know, and I find it somewhat sad that one of the first things that were done in terms of addressing uh, some of our economic concerns was to protect the tax cuts for people like Donald Trump, but then to go in and cut emergency fuel assistance for poor people and to go after food and nutrition programs and Pell Grants. That's not the way we should be balancing the budget. But the Washington Post talks about these tax cuts for the, wealth, the wealthy that were not paid for. On top of that, two wars that were not paid for. Now, I'm against these wars. But if you're for them, you ought to pay for them. That's the, way we, that's the way we have done it throughout our history. World War II, we paid for it. There was a war tax. We had war bonds. The Vietnam War was paid for in part by uh, eroding Lyndon Johnson's great society. It was paid for. But now we have these wars that are not paid for. $8.2 billion a month in Afghanistan alone. So I hope this is not a partisan agenda when we talk about the war in Afghanistan. And I, I'm, I'm, not, we're not, I'm not here to put the blame on one party or another. I hope that we can have these amendments on the floor and have some thoughtful discussion about ways we could bring this war to an end. I think Democrats and I know a lot of Republicans feel that we should bring this war to an end. And in terms of energy policy, uh, I think people are horrified that we continue to protect taxpayer subsidies to big oil companies while they're gouging us at the gas pump. It's unbelievable that we can't have a debate on this floor about taking away these taxpayer subsidies to big oil that are making record profits. So uh, I hope that uh, we will talk a little bit more about that at the end of this debate. But at this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from California, a former member of the Rules Committee, Ms. Matsui. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Massachusetts for yielding me time. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in opposition to the rule and the underlying legislation. H.R. 1216 would put the future of primary care workforce into question. The Affordable Care Act included critical funding for several grant programs des designed to increase the size of the health care workforce and specifically to increase the number of general practice and primary care physicians. Primary care has long been neglected in our country and it has been well documented that our country faces a looming shortage of primary care providers. The Affordable Care Act will help train and develop 16,000 new primary care providers. That means 16,000 more primary care doctors to help keep our children and families healthy. As studies strongly associate healthier outcomes with regular access to care. Unfortunately, the bill before us would call all of this into question. If this bill were enacted, we would no longer have the pipeline of primary care providers to meet demand. And we would continue the status quo, which for too many is either foregoing care or seeking care in the emergency room. This perpetuates the onset of chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. This is increasing costs and costing lives. I urge my colleagues to reject this rule and to vote down this bill for the future of our physical and fiscal health of our constituents and our country. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back her time. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm going to reserve at this time. Gentlewoman reserves. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, this time I'd like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. McGovern, and uh, to my friend uh, on the other side of the aisle. I want to uh, say that I'll be offering an amendment to uh, the defense authorization bill, which would defund the war in Libya. Uh, the war is unconstitutional. The President did not come to this Congress. He went to the UN Security Council. He, he went to a number of international bodies, didn't come to the United States Congress. 
Last week, the President uh, did not observe uh, the uh, tolling of the War Powers Act, so he's in violation of the statute. Uh, the uh, action over in Libya has already exceeded the UN mandate. It's in violation of, it, of the UN mandate, and there have been violations of international law. What are we doing there? Why does anyone think we can afford it? And why, why aren't we trying to find a path to peace so we aren't called upon to spend more money there? I mean, these are the questions we have to be asking, and that's why Congress should start by saying, look, you're not going to spend any more money over there. And there are people who are saying, Mr. Speaker, that, well, it's not, it's not the United States, it's NATO. Now think about this. The Guardian UK did this study where 93% of the cruise missiles are paid for by the U.S., 66% of the personnel involved in Libya, against Libya, from the U.S., 50% of the aircraft, 50% of all ships, and they're saying this is a NATO operation? Come on. I mean, we really have to recognize what's going on here, which is an expansion of the war power by the executive, and it's time that we challenge that. And one thing we certainly shouldn't do is to support uh, the amendment offered by my friend Mr. McKeon that wants to hand over to the president Congress's constitutional authority to declare an authorized war, substantially altering the delicate balance of power which the Founding Fathers envisioned. The, a the re annual reauthorization of the Department of Defense contains unprecedented and dangerous language which gives the President virtually unchecked power to take this country to war and to keep us there. The bill substantially undermines the Constitution, the institution that the Constitution set up, that is Congress, and sets the, American, uh, the United States on a path to permanent war. Congress has to protect the American people from the overreach of any chief executive, Democrat, Republican, any chief executive who's enamored with unilateralism, preemption, first strike, and the power to prosecute war without constitutional authority or statutory prescriptions. Permanent global war isn't the answer. It's not going to increase our national security. Far from ridding the world of terrorism, it will become a terrorist recruitment program. The war in Iraq based on lies. The war in Afghanistan based on a misreading of history. Yet, in Iraq, we'll spend over $3 trillion. In Afghanistan, we've already spent over a half a trillion dollars. We have people out of work here. We have people who are losing their homes, losing their health care, losing their retirement securities, security. And all we hear from the White House, they want more war or they want authorization for more war. We have to stop that. And while we're stopping that, we have to stop this national security state and stop the extension of the Patriot Act, which is also in this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, Mr. McGovern. Thank you. Bye. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I need to point out to my colleague from Massachusetts, as I do almost every time that we are on the floor together, and, and I do enjoy being on the floor with him, that he always brings up the fact that we had a surplus when President Clinton left office. Well, the reason we had a surplus, Mr. Speaker, when President Clinton left office had nothing to do with President Clinton. It had all to do with the fact that we had Republicans in charge of the Congress. And just before the Democrats took over the Congress in 2007, as my colleague from Massachusetts so well knows, the uh, CBO projected that there would be a surplus in the United States. However, the Democrats took over in January 2007 and immediately we began running deficits because of their profligate spending. I'd also like to point out to my colleague from Massachusetts, as he so well knows, that the Democrats who are in control of the Senate held a vote last week on whether or not to uh, change the tax code in order to disallow incentives that are given to the oil companies for uh, securing oil for this country. And as he knows, again, it's controlled by the Democrats. It was turned down by the Senate. So I, I would like to point out to him that Republicans are not responsible for the deficit, and Republicans are not responsible for denying uh, legal tax exemptions to oil companies. It is the Democrats who are responsible for that. I'll allow my colleague to make comments, but I won't allow him to rewrite history. Mr. Speaker, we have great political unrest in the Middle East, and 
and growing demand from China threatens our ability to secure long-term reserves of oil from foreign entities. That's why we must pursue an alternative energy policy in this country, one that puts to use our domestic supplies and technologies. Republicans are going to continue to pursue an all the above energy plan aimed at increasing our domestic production to bring down energy prices while creating jobs here at home and ending our dependence on foreign sources of oil. What that means, Mr. Speaker, is we believe in conservation, we believe in alternatives, but we also believe in using the resources that the good Lord gave us here in this country, which are being denied to the American people by our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Mr. Speaker, American families cannot wait any longer for relief at the pump. American families cannot wait any longer for increased jobs. As we head back to our districts for the Memorial Day holiday, it's fitting that we should all give thanks to those who've given their lives in defense of the freedom that we very much cherish. Every day, courageous young men and women from all over America volunteer to serve our country in the military. They do not join for the great pay, luxurious lifestyle, and swanky accommodations. They join the military and serve with dignity and honor because they love this country and they love what we stand for. They serve a much higher purpose than themselves. What our troops provide for us can be summarized in one word, America. We need now to all come together as supporters of the men and women of the armed forces and their families as proud Americans and provide them with the tools and resources that these brave volunteers deserve which is why my colleagues and I all need to vote for the underlying bill, the defense authorization bill, but we also need to vote for the rule which is going to allow for almost unlimited number of amendments to be offered, Mr. Speaker, unlike what our colleagues did when they were in charge in the 110th and 111th Congress. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from North Carolina reserves. A gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. I yield myself this time as I may consume. Without objection. Uh, the late great Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, you're entitled to your own opinions but not your own facts. Uh, and the fact is, Mr. Speaker, when this record surplus was turned into a record deficit, I would remind the gentlelady that the Republicans controlled the House, they controlled the Senate, and they controlled the White House. Uh, and that is when we passed these tax cuts for the richest people in the world, and they were not paid for. And that is when we embarked on two wars that were not paid for. It appears that the general lady wants to continue these wars. I want to end them. But if you're going to continue them, then pay for them, because it's not fair to, our, to the men and women who are, sacri who are sacrificing their lives and the men and women who are in harm's way and their families to just accumulate all this debt you know, and pass it on to them and their children and their grandchildren. We ought, if we're going to go to war, we all ought to take some responsibility. And finally, uh, the, the issue of the, the, oil, uh, the taxpayer subsidies for oil companies. It, we have not had a debate on this House floor or a vote on this House floor on this. I don't care what the Senate did or did not do. I'm not a member of the United States Senate. I'm a member of the United States House of Representatives. And under this new and open process, that we were promised, by the way, not a single open rule yet, not a single open rule, but under this new and open process, we can't bring an amendment to the floor to be able to debate this issue. So I would uh, respectfully suggest that uh, maybe you know, my, my colleague from North Carolina and the Rules Committee will once in a while vote for an open rule so we can bring some of these things to the floor. At this time, I'd like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition uh, to the rule uh, and the underlying bill in its current form. By delaying the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, this bill will weaken our armed forces and further confuse an issue that our country and our military have simply moved past. This bill in its current form says to gay and lesbian service members, you're welcome to fight and die for our country as long as you live in secret. Mr. Speaker, Don't Ask, Don't Tell requires brave members of our military to live in constant fear of being dismissed for an aspect of their personal lives that has no bearing on their job performance. It's a law that serves no purpose. It's a law that 
hinders our military's effectiveness. It's a law that Congress has already voted to repeal, and it's a law, frankly, that's un-American. Yet here we are again considering a bill that would continue to codify discrimination. We should not go back to those dark days, and we will not go back. In April, the service chiefs reported to the House Armed Services Committee that the process of certifying the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell is moving forward, and the response from service members, service members has been overwhelmingly positive. Vice Admiral Gortney, Staff Director for the Joint Chiefs, reported the repeal process was moving ahead without incident. Clifford Stanley, Undersecretary, Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, told the committee that training programs to prepare for the repeal are going extremely well. So we know the military supports moving forward, as do the vast majority of the American people. Seventy-two percent support the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Don't Ask, Don't Tell hurts military readiness and national security every day. To date, over 13,000 service members who have been trained at taxpayer expense have been forced out of the military under this policy. It's hard to believe that dismissing mission-critical service members or linguists fluent in Arabic, Korean, and Farsi will somehow make us more effective or combat ready. The Commander-in-Chief the Secretary of Defense, who I might add was originally appointed by President Bush, as well as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, support repeal. Mr. Speaker, it's time for Don't Ask, Don't Tell to move from the law books to the dustbins of history. Its only value is as a lesson to future generations that our nation is stronger when we welcome all members of the American family and weaker when we divide and discriminate. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'll reserve because uh, I am ready to close, but I believe the gentleman from Massachusetts has additional speakers, and I'll reserve. Thank you. Gentlewoman reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to the rule and support the gentleman's motion to move the previous question. This motion demonstrates we are serious about creating jobs, growing the economy, and lowering gas prices. My Republican colleagues are instead relitigating an issue that was debated exhaustively over the past year. As I traveled all across my district last week, not surprisingly, not a single one of my constituents said the health reform should be altered to fund graduate medical education and qualified teaching health centers through direct appropriations. Rather, my constituents want to hear what Congress is doing now to lower the price of a gallon of gas. They want to know how we are responding to turmoil in the Middle East and speculation by Wall Street, which are causing this price spike. In Montauk Point, the easternmost point of my district, regular unleaded gas, 4.89 a gallon yesterday. Recreational and commercial fishermen, small businesses, and the whole local economy are all being squeezed by gas prices. My constituents want to know what Congress is doing in response and how we plan to create jobs and expand our economy. But since the new Republican majority took over this year, we haven't debated a single jobs initiative or any meaningful proposal to reduce the price of gas for consumers. Not one. In the 140 days since the 112th Congress began, we have debated zero job bills and only a handful of bills related to energy, most of which focus on reducing the price of gas 10 years from now, maybe. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote against the previous question so that we can focus on our priorities, reducing gas prices, creating jobs, and helping middle class Americans keep up in today's economy. I yield back. New York yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentlewoman from North Carolina. Would, is the gentleman from Massachusetts prepared to close? Yeah, with, I'm the final speaker. Mr. Speaker, how much time I, I have left? The gentleman from Massachusetts has ten and a half minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and how much time do I have left, Mr. Speaker? The gentlewoman from North Carolina has nine minutes. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, I yield myself this time as I may consume. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to support the efforts of my colleague from New York, Mr. Bishop. And uh, let me just say the American people are sending a clear message to Republicans. Show us the jobs. After 140 days of the new GOP majority, they keep pursuing their agenda that, uh, that destroys jobs and stalls our economic growth. This week is no different. And today, Republicans are only making matters worse voting to kill graduate medical education and qualified teaching health care centers. The previous question, as Mr. Bishop referred to it, uh, is based on H.R. 964.
the Federal Price Gouging Prevention Act. Uh, and it takes a, a stand for working families facing tough times uh, and paying so much more at the pump. During an international oil crisis, as dense big oil from taking advantage of consumers and engaging in price gouging. The cost of a barrel of oil and a gallon of gas have already reached their highest levels in years with no end in sight, and America's middle class is paying the price. Republicans must join with Democrats to oppose, uh, to oppose price gouging and to ease the burden on our middle class. We must work together to create jobs, strengthen the middle class, and responsibly reduce the deficit. To help consumers at the pump and provide some relief to small businesses and families struggling with high gas prices, this legislation expands the authority of the President to release oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to com combat market manipulation and bring down the price and make it a federal crime to sell gasoline at excessive prices. The legislation also protects taxpayers holds big oil accountable, repeals the largest tax breaks for the five big five oil companies, and ensures that oil companies pay billions of dollars owed to taxpayers for drilling on public lands. This is part of our multifaceted effort to lower the price of gas now, bring relief to consumers and taxpayers, strengthen our energy security, and reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and hold big oil accountable. Republicans' drill-only, oil-above-all plan is really a boon for big oil and does nothing to reduce the pain at the pump for America's middle-class families uh, who are facing these enormous prices each and every day. Republicans are simply returning to the Bush policies for big oil, continuing to pursue drill-only policies with fewer safeguards and no accountability that has us sending a billion dollars a day uh, overseas for foreign oil. Mr. Speaker, um, if we defeat the previous question, I will offer an amendment to the rule to provide that immediately after the House adopts this rule, it will bring up H.R. 964, the Federal Price Gouging Prevention Act introduced by Representative Tim Bishop of New York. And Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record along with extraneous materials immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no uh, and defeat the previous question so we can debate and pass a bill that actually addresses the price of gas. Um, I have tried, Mr. Speaker, on numerous times in the Rules Committee to bring responsible amendments to the floor that would get at this issue of taxpayer subsidies to big oil companies, and every single time my Republican friends have voted no. Every time there's been an opportunity to try to address this issue, they have voted no. Well, I urge my colleagues to, to, vote, uh, to, 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 uh, to vote no on the, uh, and defeat the previous question, and I urge a no vote on the rule, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to um, bring our attention again to the upcoming Memorial Day because we're going to be honoring the fallen and praise their service and sacrifice. We need to remember the families of the fallen and reassure them that the, their sacrifice and the life of that hero was not lost in vain. We're also very proud of our troops who are currently serving and we want to make sure that they get that message from us in this body, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to point out to my colleague from Massachusetts that the unemployment rate was 5% when they took over the Congress, or approximately 5% when they took over the Congress in January 2007. Under their control and President Obama's, it reached 10% and has stayed at around 9% since they were, while they were in control. Um, so I want, I want to, again, make it clear that we have worked hard to make the economy work again, and we're going to continue that. Mr. Speaker, although I've said it also before, it bears repeating. Americans are sick and tired of reckless government spending creating only government jobs, which hurts our overall economy and creates the high unemployment. Americans are deeply concerned about the outrageous level of federal debt. Our constituents are concerned about the piece of our economy that is now owned by other countries like China. 
they are very concerned about the fact that so much of our tax dollars, the tax dollars they pay, go toward paying interest on the debt instead of using it for the country's immediate needs. Mr. Speaker, that's why Americans are looking at the new House Republican majority for real answers to their concerns. After four years of a complete lack of leadership in Congress, we've rolled up under the Democrats, we've rolled up our sleeves and are making the tough decisions to get our economy and fiscal house back in shape. The federal government must learn to live within its means and be accountable for how it spends taxpayer money. House Republicans are continuing to fulfill our pledge to America and keep the promises we made to the American people before the election last November. I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of congressional oversight and against special interest by voting in favor of this rule and the underlying bills. I yield back the balance of my time and I move the previous question on the resolution. All time having expired. The question is on ordering the previous question on the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The gentleman from Massachusetts. On, on that, I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen. The yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote on the question of adopting the resolution. This is a 15-minute vote.